Well, it's 4th of July weekend, and I've been wanting to do this, you know, Revolutionary War family history video for some time. So who better to bring on the show than one of our favorite guests, Diane Richard. She will be telling us how to research our Revolutionary War ancestors here in just a moment. But first, let me introduce myself. My name is Connie Knox. I am a lifelong genealogist here to help you go further faster and factually with your family history research. Now, don't forget that there is a website, a newsletter, and a Facebook page. Uh, all of that is available as well as don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell so that you get notified each time I upload a video. That button is over here, I think. Uh, if you like the videos that I produce here on Genealogy TV, consider becoming a Genealogy TV channel member. Channel members get early access to the videos and some additional perks. You can click the join button to learn more about that. Now, you're going to love this episode. It has a ton of great information, so much so that I had to break this up into two episodes. So this is part one of two. Now, these interviews, I like to call them footnotes. Whenever I do these interviews with special guests, I call them footnotes because it's in the footnotes where the real sources are. And today's real source is Diane Richard. She is a professional genealogist out of the Raleigh, North Carolina area. She is the publisher of the North Carolina Genealogical Society Journal and the owner of Mosaic Research and Project Management, also known as Mosaic RPM as well as a regular guest here on Genealogy TV. Diane can be found at mosaicrpm.com if you're looking for her. Now, Diane was kind enough to provide us a handout for today's episode, uh, and that will be widely available for everybody. Uh, we'll talk more about where to download that a little bit later, but for now, let's jump into how we can do our research for our Revolutionary War ancestors right now. Diane, welcome back. I'm so glad you're here. We're going to talk about Revolutionary War records today. I'm super excited. Welcome back. Well, thank you so much. I'm, I'm excited too. It's a, it's a fun topic and there's a lot of really neat resources. So I think we'll uh, get a lot of new good information out there. So I pulled up on Wikipedia just to give everybody kind of a quick little recap about the American Revolutionary War. So I'm going to read this one little paragraph from Wikipedia and here it goes. This is... The American Revolutionary War was fought between 1775 and 1783, also known as the American War of Independence, and was fought primarily between the Kingdom of Great Britain and her 13 colonies in America, resulting in the overthrow of the British rule in the colonies and the establishment of the United States of America. So this is the founding the founding part of our country here, and so this kind of this is kind of fun to talk about the Revolutionary War and the records for genealogists. So I'm gonna uh, let you jump into it. I know you're gonna share your screen with us. And I think the first thing up is maybe the National Archives. Yes, it is. So let me do that, get the screen up. And, uh, and actually it's not the home page of the National Archives, it's actually the military records page for the American Revolution. And I want to uh, start here because this is the place where a lot of the records people are seeking for the Revolutionary War are housed. It's not necessarily the place that most of us access these records nowadays. And on this page, it's a great finding aid for the National Archives, and it talks about the American Revolution and the records held. And you can see as I'm sliding down, these different categories of records, pension records is something we often look at, bounty land records, et cetera. Each of these tabs will give you more detail on it, but what we're going to do in a few minutes is actually talk about the places where most of us actually access them. We don't need to go to the National Archives anymore to do this. Well, before you move on, <laughs> I have a question. Yeah, I, had to, oh, I suspected you would. Notice that pause there. <laughs> so you know me. I just. <laughs> I, so, I am counting on those questions, Connie. <laughs> just. Uh, explain because i know bounty land records are are one that are uh important can you give just a quick explanation as to why they exist what they were for well the thing to think about and i've just clicked down on bounty land records is that unlike today where we have our military service and they are paid a salary etc back for when these the revolutionary war was occurring people weren't paid 
in a way to serve. I mean, they could get some militia payments, et cetera. Payments were all made after the war and the country was poor enough that it really didn't have cash in hand. So what happens is land was the way that many were paid, um, especially when you're talking continental line soldiers, they were typically paid in land. And then once they had that land, they could then con sell it, live on it, Etc. You know, they could treat it as the cash that it was for them. Um, so that's why we have these bounty land records because they're tied to an alternative way for people to have been paid both for the Revolutionary War and then actually the later War of 1812 also. And thus, they make great records for genealogists. <laughs> oh, definitely. I mean, we love, um, whether your ancestor actually even took up the bounty land, knowing who they sold it to. And I mean, there's just a lot that goes, goes into that. And like any record, view a bounty land record is almost the equivalent of an, a pension in the sense that somebody was trying to get paid for service. And if a soldier did not survive, then sometimes it was their widows, their children, et cetera. So you can learn a lot from them. That was really kind of it. I want to set the stage that, you know, as the National Archives, it is the federal repository that does hold the majority of the Revolutionary War records that people typically look for. It's just not the way we need, we, uh, we don't need to go to DC nowadays to access them. So that's what the next few topics will be about. So I know that on the National Archives, we can access this information for free. Um, but my experience has been that it might be a little easier on Ancestry.com. Well, actually, at the National Archives, if you physically go to DC, or go to a regional location that has the microfilm for these records, then you could access that for free on your own. If you were to pay the National Archives to get you a record because you don't go to DC, that is not gonna be free. Okay. You, you know, um, you, you would pay a fee to request from the National Archives, I want the Revolutionary War pension paperwork for uh, Joe Schmo that there's gonna be a fee attached to that, but you personally can go access that and there would be no fees. Um, okay. And so that's, that's why these, and what, what has, um, the other component of it, the National Archives very smartly worked with other organizations and partnership to make these records available. And for some of these services, they're a pay service. Some of these services are not a pay service, but it's also what facilitates access at the National Archives of the digital versions. Because if you're on National Archives, you can always access this information for free on their computers. I guess that's where I was going. Yeah. We, right. and, and we have ways that we can actually do it as individuals. Um, because you had mentioned Ancestry.com. Ancestry.com, which I'm showing you here, is one of the partners. The thing that a lot of people forget is that many local library systems provide um, those who have the library card access from home. Or in the case here in North Carolina, the State Archives, uh, the State Library actually of North Carolina, Government Heritage Library has a library card and through that library card I can access an ancestry online from home. So oh, okay. so though I personally have a subscription because I use it every day for my business many can get access through a local library, a college library, a state library, etc and not pay for that because in a way it's one of the services being provided by those libraries. And they yeah. call it the Ancestry Library Edition, but yeah. it's the same thing. Yep. So, um, so that said, what I wanted to do is just show people a couple of um, techniques I use to get at Revolutionary War Records on the Ancestry site. This is just the main screen because I just wanted uh, people to be reminded what it looks like. And this is their main page. If you want to think about it, Ancestry has also created a page. It's under their U.S. military collection, and it's called the Revolutionary War. And to be honest, how I get to this page is I do a Google search outside Ancestry and just say Revolutionary War Ancestry. And then it takes me to this page because I know sometimes it's challenging to look at URLs and get to them. And, and I know you'll put the notes with the video with that information. And, you know, my rule of thumb to everybody when I'm, whenever I'm talking to you, 
Google on what I'm saying and you'll get there. <laughs> and, and it's really, to me, the easiest way to do it. And they've created a page. And as you can see, it's called the Revolutionary War, 1775 to 1783. And you can put in a name and a place. And what this is going to do is work through a subset of the Revolutionary War collections that Ancestry has. I can I see on that one page, they actually have all the military collections there. Civil yeah. War, World War I, World War II. Yes, each military, every or each conflict has its own tab on here. So once you get in, you could then shift to Civil War, World War One, World War Two, other conflicts, etc. Um, and so it's it's a night nice, to me. It's a great place to start because they have, in a way, created a package of a bunch of their databases. Um, but just being the person that I am, I like to kind of look further afield, also. And what you're going to see here is I love to search card catalogs. And even something like Ancestry or any online database often has a card catalog or equivalent. And what you're going to see is under title, I put in Revolutionary War. And it came up with this list of other resources. Alabama Revolutionary War residents, New York pension claims, uh, North Carolina and Tennessee land warrants. Pennsylvania, etc. So again, I am a big believer in the card catalog. I see you've also filtered it to Canada, North America, and USA. Yes, <laughs> just pointing that out because I talk about the card catalog a lot, um, and this is one of my favorite ways to research anything is through the card catalog. And the interesting thing with the card catalog is notice I title Revolutionary War, but then what I have also done as another version of it is I did keywords Revolutionary War, and I put it in quotes because the way Ancestry has identified or any card catalog identifies things, sometimes the interesting words are in the title, but more often the interesting words are in the keywords. And if you remember on the previous screen, I think it had found a total of 57, I think is the results. This is now 307. So that's almost 200, I mean, basically 250 more finds occur when it's a keyword revolutionary war versus in a title. And so that's something that's important to recognize. And part of it is that like here, Wyoming military service and veterans records, we don't see the words revolutionary war. And actually I'm not quite sure why that one came up because the dates on it are funny. So, and that's the other caveat. I put in Revolutionary War, I get something that's 20th century. The next ones are clearly, clearly, and we get down to New York. New York sales of Loyalist land. Well, Loyalist is a Revolutionary War component, which we'll talk about a little bit more um, in a few resources. So you don't see the words Revolutionary War. So that's why that would have popped up. So again, even when you're searching the card catalog, you know, you have to think about it a bit and go, wait a minute, does that make sense? But it is just another way to get into, try to find what in this case Ancestry has that might have relevance. I'd also like to point out that you put quotes around uh, Revolutionary War as opposed to having just the two words Revolutionary War without the quotes, because that means it's searching specifically for revolutionary war and not everything that has either the word revolutionary or war <laughs> and or war yes. uh, in the collection. And definitely. And, and part of that is I did that. And when I got 307, it was like, well, that, that worked fine. And when I had done the title one before, I had not put quotes, but I only got 57 entries. So I didn't have to worry about too many things for me to look through. Um, but I always use quotes and I'm concerned about how many hits I might come up. So I want to mention these because that compilation that Ancestry takes you to that's Revolutionary War, I guarantee you is not encompassing all of these 300 databases. So you're going to want to look through and then you can filter by location. So if you're looking for a particular state, you can put that state in and see what pops up. But there are a couple of specific collections and again, my rule of thumb is I often search outside Ancestry to get in, but remember Loyalists came up. There was the New York Loyalist records. And something to remember is the revolutionary did involve two sides. We have a tendency to refer to what became the United States of America as the Patriots. We kind of, you know, often people will talk about the Patriots of the Revolutionary War. Well, we did have the other side, which were the Loyalists. 
or those who were loyal can, remained loyal to England and more typically they had a tendency like out of North Carolina they had a tendency to go to South Carolina and then end up to Nova Scotia or go elsewhere or Nova Scotia became a big location for loyalists to go to many went back to England also the, they relinquished their lands and went back to England yeah so the thing to remember in a, any conflict is which side individuals end up on is often a matter of preservation of life and family, farm, etc. cetera. Uh, we often like to think that our ancestors that fought for the Revolutionary War were showing a particular vigor against the United Kingdom or those who were loyalists were, and sometimes the answer is much more complex than that. And we have a lot of ancestors that you're not gonna find listed in either side. And it doesn't mean I mean, they were just keeping a roof over their head, food on their table, et cetera. Um, so I just like to caution people to recognize that these were our ancestors living life the best they could at this time. And so sometimes you, and, and you are likely to find those who are identified as loyalists. Now, a loyalist did not always leave the country either or what became the United States. So you have to put it in the context of that time in terms of how, how loyal were they? You know, was it a convenience of the moment to make sure that their farm didn't get roughshod over to support the loyalist commanders because they were all living there? And then once the war ended, you're like, okay, I'm happy with the outcome, you know, because you weren't gonna put your family at risk if you didn't have to, so. So true, um, so true. And what else so, you got on Ancestry Anything? Yes. So we have loyalists. So I wanted to mention them. It's a three-volume set. Um, this first one covers North Carolina, Virginia, and some other places. There's This also is loyalist, but it's just loyalists in North Carolina. And the reason I just want to mention this is, again, recognize that you might have multiple databases in Ancestry or the other places we talk that are relevant, but check it out. Don't assume that you come across the one database called Loyalists that covers North Carolina and don't look at this one which is a different database called Loyalists in North Carolina because they're going to be based on differing resources. Good. So yeah. um, I just like, I, 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 how can I say, it's the engineer in me and I know you're, you act very much like me that uh, we want to find every little thing we can. <laughs> well I'm very analytic and, and even the way you're even going through your tabs, I'm very analytic and it's almost like your tabs across the screen uh, as we go through them is almost like a research plan, right? Think about it. Okay, so I got yeah. a research question. I create a research plan and I'm going to look in these places, bing, 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 line them up and then start, then start going through your tabs as, as if it's like a little mini research plan. Yeah, and that's, you know, when I was pulling this together, I was just trying to think of what is, you know, commonly available, what has what, and working the way down to where you get to things that are more narrowly focused. So um, starting with Ancestry is a site that most people are familiar with. I think I, I think that's the end of my Ancestry. Okay, um, so yes, let's visit Family Search now. It's another huge platform. This one is now freely available. Um, you don't have to worry about going to a library or gaining access uh, through your library. And again, FamilySearch also has a partnership with the National Archives. Um, so actually Ancestry, which I talked about, FamilySearch, which I'm talking about now, and then another site I'll talk about in a few minutes, they all have these relationships with the National Archives to make the information available. So this is the main home page. I just want to again show it to you so you can see what it looks like. Now in Family Search again, getting to our catalog search, and something to recognize with Family Search is that where Ancestry is databases with a few digitized books. When you look at the catalog for Family Search, this is a mix of databases, but also the huge library out in Salt Lake City and its holdings, as well as other associated um, facilities that it has relationships with. And the reason I mention this is this becomes a great resource, not just for data, which we want to look at, but also published volumes. And sometimes we can access those through family search because they've been digitized. So again, I did a keyword search and you can see I did revolutionary war and I did put it in quotations again, but look what it came up with, which was 5,552 results. 
Mm, so researching all day long. Yes. So that's a lot of results there. Um, and I just wanted to impress upon you. It is a large number of results. But if we look at, you know, some of the first few, you have Revolutionary War Pensioners reported in 1828. You have some Indiana material. You have Bounty Lands, which we talked about on the National Archives. You have um, Cecil County. It's got to be Maryland in the Red War. Um, so you can see right away that this is a mix of differing materials coming from different places. And we even have things that have come out of the National Genealogical Society, etc. So obviously for family search, I what I would suggest to do would be to go to place at a certain point. And we might want to put in a particular state and see what comes. And here I go to North Carolina, and then what we can see is it pulls out these Revolutionary War materials we might uh, want to look at. Because obviously, again, this is a huge list, but again, that catalog gives you a huge um, insight into what materials might be available here. And for family search, because there's a lot of books that are listed that may not be digitized, you can take that information though and then work through your local library and say, can you do an interlibrary loan to get me that book? And that's something I still do to this day. I mean, libraries are happy to support interlibrary loan services. Well, once they reopen um, after the current situation, and that's a great way to get access to a book that might help your research that you've learned about by looking here for your Revolutionary War ancestor. Well, I know that here just this week, our libraries have reopened as far as curbside pickup. So you could call ahead if, you know, and say, hey, I'm looking for this book if they happen to have it. And, if, uh, right. If, if, they, if they physically happen to have it, you could get it. I know as far as interlibrary loan, that is like all shut down right now because I've tried. <laughs> so yeah. I figured it doesn't hurt to ask. And I've learned that until they reopen. Um, but, you know, it, it, but still, this is something you put on your research list, as you said, you know, your research plan. And then when the libraries reopen, then you don't even have to think about what to do. You can immediately just put all those requests in. And you can Google it. You never know. You might just find it in Google Books. Well, it, go be be well, between Google Books, Internet Archive, Hathi Trust, and et cetera, yeah, there's, a, trust me, there's a, I look first online and only if I cannot find it online do I then use interlibrary loan. So definitely. So, so that, I just wanted to show that one catalog. And there are a few specific databases, again, that FamilySearch has. And to be honest, what I do, again, is I just go family search and I go revolutionary, you know, war or something in North Carolina. And I happen to know that the North Carolina pay vouchers are here. <laughs> and um, do you find very much in the pay vouchers? Oh, so I love the pay vouchers. I love the pay vouchers. So the key thing that I look for in Revolutionary War pay vouchers is one, a pay voucher will indicate whether it's for militia service or whether it was like providing pigs and cows or something we don't know. Now, pay vouchers can be very vague. I mean, but yeah. if it says militia service, that's militia service. I mean, that's very clear. If it doesn't say anything, you can't assume militia service. It could be for services rendered, as we say. Yeah. But what happens is on the back of a pay voucher, because this was a form of legal tender at the time, you'll find people signing the back of it as they turned it in to, as, um, to pay for something, you know. So you can find original signatures on the back of a pay voucher, for example. The great part about North Carolina uh, pay vouchers for the Revolutionary War is that um, these were handled by military districts and military districts or multi-county jurisdictions. So they covered typically around eight counties and that's not necessarily sufficient enough to know that it's your ancestor. And, you know, you might be able to go, okay, it's at least in Salisbury district and they lived out in Rowan County. So I'm happy with that, that's good. But you wanna know, was it Rowan County? Well, a militia pay voucher will often say for what county the militia service was for. 
So it's that kind of information that you want both the specific county reference, because that helps you know that it's your family member, but also to find out, did they sign the back? Did they sign it over to somebody else in the family? Or, you know, so it's always checking the back. I always get a pay voucher, see what it says on the front, and then I always look at the back. And that is a great tip. You should always look at the back of any document, any document. There could be stamps, there could be who knows. Yep. Lots of juicy details are hiding on the backs. And in fact, I get frustrated. I've had people provide me just the front of pay vouchers. So I've come to this database because I want to check the backs. But the other thing is, is often somebody will stop at the first pay voucher because they'll go, that's enough for me for my DAR service or my SAR service, or if it's a lineage organization they want to get in. Well, I, I'm going to check every single pay voucher for that name because I want to find out, are there other details? Somebody may not sign pay voucher number one, but they signed pay voucher number five. So you could, you, you know, that's the thing to remember is these pay vouchers weren't necessarily issued all at exactly the same time to the person in the same way. And I want to go through and make sure also if I do see signatures, are they the same signature? Because could there be two people with the same name? So it's just to me always very important to make sure you look at every single one. Yeah, so basically whenever I look at the these pay vouchers or any record actually, any Revolutionary War record, I try to find all of them for the name that I'm researching. So if I'm researching John Smith, I'm going to look at every pay voucher for John Smith in the military district that's applicable because I want to see did he sign his name on some or not on others? Or do I see two different John Smith signatures that don't match? Does that mean there's two John Smiths or does it mean a court, court clerk signed for him or whatever? So I want to call all those little details because, you know, in our genealogy research, the devil's in the details. Yeah, and, so I, <laughs> and, and so you would hate to think that you had to pay vouchers in front of you and didn't look at each of them to get that one little detail that might actually be really important to, for your research. All right, so besides that one, I also wanted to mention United States Revolutionary War roles. And war roles are great because instead of looking at what we call a compiled service record, which is where somebody has gone through and compiled things, so you, you know what your soldier did, but you kind of lose the context of their service on the bigger piece. You also lose who else was serving with them because often um, these militia units and muster rolls are reflecting groups that join together. They join, they're, they're serving together, et cetera. So I like to look at war roles. Um, and so as the description says here, it's muster rolls, pay rolls, strength returns. It's just all kinds of lists that were created um, by the American army during the Revolutionary War. And so I just want to mention this again. I just search on this title and family search and it will get you right to this database. And then I actually had one more as I had mentioned compiled service roles, the United States Revolutionary War compiled service records, 1775-1783. Again, my tactic is we can sometimes go to a centralized place like when we talked on Ancestry. You know, Ancestry had that very Revolutionary War page that I could go in and search on. I personally like to come to individual databases if I can, because I like the focus of knowing what this database is, what it has, who else is there, and then I can look for my person, but also see if there's other people from the same location. I, that's just, you know, it's just one of the things I've learned uh, that high level searching, you can find things, but it can be overwhelming. So I actually like to come into individual databases and, and be able to just explore them a bit more carefully. I think that concludes our family search section. I think you wanted to talk about fold three next. This was called something different when it first started its life and its focus has for the most part been military records which is why it's it is now called fold three. This is the main landing page and what I want you to notice for the main landing page is on this left-hand side, in essence, you just have each of the military conflicts listed as well as non-military records. And, and what if you click on the Revolutionary War, which is what I have done, you can enter a name here and search on it. Or at the very top here, 
Another option is you can put your name here and then what you can do is pick Revolutionary War. Now this is a paid service. So I have, have a subscription for this. Yes, this is a paid service and two things. One, again, some libraries and archives will provide access. So for example, the Government and Heritage Library, which is part of the State Library of North Carolina, I can access Fold3 from home with my library card. The other trick I'll just tell people is don't hesitate to see if there's a one week trial that you can do. Now I say that and the thing I like to also say is make sure on day six you go in and cancel it because I don't want I don't want people coming to me and, and saying Diane you said it was a seven day trial <laughs> and you know so be cautious I, I, I be, I'm being very upfront with you I only recommend a trial if you immediately put on your calendar on day six. see notice I say day six I don't go to day seven I'm not going to trust their tr interpretation of when it started or not but that can be an opportunity if you don't have other access to spend a week exploring it a week may be all you need you can get a lot of research done if you're not willing to sleep and you know you only eat minimally and stuff like that and at the end you can then decide whether it, you want to continue or not and because it is part of ancestry if you have an ancestry subscription you can sometimes get discounts to fold three and newspapers.com and vice versa so um in their sales there's um i was gonna say i've seen fold it available three. for free sometimes on things like memorial day or fourth of july um, you know, specific. you just, you just took the words right out of my mouth. See, they were coming out and you grabbed them, my bad. but I was just gonna, I was just gonna say, uh, just this past Memorial day, fold three made its military records available and ancestry will often do the same. I would next, um, for, uh, military records also have a tendency to become freely available on veterans day. Yeah. So I would, uh, when that holiday comes along and it doesn't mean they won't do it other, other times throughout the year and that's always a great option too is to look for the weekend near a holiday that they decide to offer it for free access because they want you to get excited about using their resource and and the more you play with it and the more you find then there's a chance uh, you might ultimately want to subscribe. So here's one of my suggestions. <clears throat> For those who want to exercise the free uh, trial, get your research plan in order before you start the trial and get all your little ancestors and everybody together that you know, all the information that you know that you want to research in these records before you turn it on. That way you got a plan and you prioritized your plan and you turn that sucker on for six days <laughs> and go to it, you know? And then uh, you probably, if you if you prepared, you probably get through a lot of your list. Oh, oh, definitely. I I can't tell you how many binges on newspaper websites I have done. Similarly, I have more access to more of them now. Um, but it's, to me, it, it's it's the way to go because you get in that groove too of looking at this case in terms of Revolutionary War records. You know, you get to understand them better. You know what you're going to find or not find. You better understand how they're organized. And uh, it's fun. You know, you do it for a week and then that's, you can, you can take a break after that knowing you've worked hard. One of um, the reasons why I'm not showing, well, actually the main reason I'm not showing you the detailed records for Fold3 is because it has that same relationship with the National Archives as Ancestry and Family Search. And because of that, there's a lot of overlap in terms of their databases. So what I have a tendency to do is I go to whichever is my favorite for what I'm doing. So if I'm doing just military, I'll often start at Fold3 then I will go back to Ancestry and Family Search because they have a lot more specialized and different databases. Um, so just re recognize that each of these three overlap, but then they also have their own unique records that I go to each one for. So you just have to play around with them. What can I say? Go have some fun, dabble, and go from that. So Absolutely. So that's the story on Fold3. Well, we're going to stop there for today. Part two is coming up next week, and you'll get all the rest of the information then. The link for the handout is in the description below this video, as well as in the blog post at genealogytv.org. Thank you, Diane, for the handout and your time today. We really appreciate it. Now, it is time for you to go find your Revolutionary War ancestors. So until next time, keep on climbing your family tree.